Peter Blanquen, investigador científico holandés, miembro senior en el Comité Central de Tratamiento para Adictos a la Heroína, Utrecht. También es investigador del Centro de Investigación de las Adicciones Parnasia en La Haya, Holanda. Ok, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank MUCD for inviting me over and for organizing this great, great conference. My compliments. And uh, my presentation will be about uh, heroin-assisted treatment. Many of the speakers before have already indicated that along the line of changing uh, drug policies, an important aspect is also, besides prevention, is treatment. And the treatment I will be talking about is for long-term heroin users, heroin addiction treatment. Uh, it has also been mentioned by previous speakers as heroin prescription. So what will be my presentation about? First of all, I will talk about um, some effective treatment options for heroin addicted patients. Then I will go into detail and especially about the trials we did in the Netherlands for heroin assisted treatment. But still, when you have heroin assisted treatment, it's not a solution for all problems. There will be some prob problems that remain. And then I will come to my conclusions. So what are effective treatments for opioid dependence? And it's important, like for every medical uh, uh, condition, treatment should be guided by some core principles. And first of all, when you treat patients, you, you should try and you should intervene when there is a crisis situation. And in case of addiction, that's usually an overdose or intoxication. But it can also be psychiatric or medical comorbidity. Then, if possible, and that should always be a first step, it's try to cure the patient. For each condi con medical condition that applies, and in the case of addiction, that means first initiate abstinence and then try to prevent relapse so that the patient will be abstinent for a longer time. And in case there is a relapse, it's an important aspect of treatment to try to limit the extent of relapse, both in the frequency and in the severity. But this not always is feasible. This cannot always be realized. And if cure is not possible, then some form of care becomes important. And what do I mean by care? Care is a form of treatment that aims at reducing or stabilizing drug use, drug intake, It should also aim at reducing harm, and if possible, it should stabilize and improve the health situation, both the physical, mental, and social health of the patient. And in some cases, when patients, when dependent patients are in their final phase of their lives, palliative care is also an option. So there are many proven effective medications, and I will not go into detail, but there are many proven effective medications to try to cure patients, and the most effective ones are methadone reduction programs, or buprenorphine reduction programs. Also clonidine and lofexidine are effective in helping patients to become abstinent. Naltrexone is an effective, proven effective medication and in order to pre prevent relapse after uh, abstinence is reached, naltrexone maintenance might be an effective intervention, although it's always dependent on the, um, uh, the, the extent to which the patients continue to take naltrexone. Now, when cure is not feasible, like I said, uh, care is an important next step in treatment of heroin-addicted patients aiming at stabilization of their drug use, and methadone maintenance is a quite effective, proven, proven effective medication for that, in high doses especially. Buprenorphine maintenance is also very effective in stabilizing patients. Methadone maintenance at low doses is less effective, effective. and in case when you aim at harm reduction, heroin-assisted treatment, heroin maintenance treatment has been proven an effective intervention. But, like I said, not all patients respond to these kind of treatments. And this is a study 
that is, has been uh, written by Thomas McLellan, a former drug czar of President Obama, who was uh, responsible for the demand side of the drug problem. And what is important, I think, is that he has written that in general, after treatment, 50 to 60 percent of patients within six months after treatment, they relapse into their drug use. And it's independent of the, of the substance they are addicted to, the type of mo the treatment they had, and their motivation. And this is another important study. It's by Husser, who has been following a group of narcotic addicts. Excuse me. Who followed a group of narcotic addicts for 33 years. And it was a very important study, and I can recommend to read it. But what is important in my uh, discussion is that even a group that was abstinent for more than 15 years, there was a 25% chance that they would have relapsed into drug use at the next ex assessment. So this gives you an idea of the complexity and the chronicity of opioid dependence. And this led, for instance, as we heard from our previous speaker, in Zurich, but also in the Netherlands, to a group of drug users that did not respond to all different kinds of treatments and that they were causing nuisance in the public space. And Switzerland was the first to start heroin-assisted treatment, and soon after that, in the Netherlands, we set up a trial investigating the efficacy of heroin-assisted treatment. And the discussion to provide heroin to long-term addicted heroin users goes back already to the 1980s in the Netherlands. This is a poster. It was a con conference organized by the Rotterdam Junkie Union and it already called for heroin dispensation as a recipe against deterioration of addicted people. This is the situation at the time when we started the heroin addiction trials in the Netherlands. There were estimated to be about 24,000 heroin addicted patients. And on a yearly basis, about 70% of them, estimated to be 17,000, they were in treatment. Some of them, they were in drug-free treatment, and the majority, they were in methadone maintenance. But of those that were in methadone maintenance, not everybody responded well. And there was a group of heroin addicted patients in methadone maintenance that, despite their maintenance treatment, they were still using heroin on an almost daily basis. They were often also using cocaine, benzodiazepines, large amounts of alcohol. They were in an in unstable housing situation. Often they were involved in criminal activities or for the women in prostitution, so they did not respond well to methadone maintenance treatment. And therefore we started the Dutch heroin trials. And actually there were two trials. One was to study the efficacy of prescribing injectable heroin, and the other one was uh, the studying the efficacy of prescribing inhalable heroin. Just to give you a short impression, the trial consisted, like I said, for inhaling and injectable heroin, and there were two groups, the experimental group that was offered methadone plus heroin for 12 months. And after those 12 months, treatment was discontinued, and they were set up, uh, they were transformed to adequate methadone maintenance treatment. In the control condition, they received methadone for 12 months, and they were offered the option of methadone plus heroin at a follow-up period. Now, the trial uh, aimed, was aimed at uh, heroin-dependent patients who had not responded properly to uh, methadone maintenance. And we defined that they should be dependent on heroin for at least five years. They should have been in methadone maintenance treatment for at least a year. They should visit the program regularly. They should have received an adequate methadone dosage. And in spite of that, they should be nearly using illicit heroin on a daily basis and that it should have a poor physical, mental, or social health. There were also exclusion criteria, but I won't mention them now. What did the treatment consist of? Both groups, so the experimental group and the control group, they received oral methadone plus psychosocial uh, treatment. And the experimental group was offered on top of that pharmaceutical grade heroin, either to be inhaled or to be injected, for seven days a week, three times a day, with a maximum doses of 1,000 milligram, which is for pharmaceutical grade heroin is quite a lot. And the doses which they were individually titrated and there were no other illicit drugs prescribed. Before the patients in the trial, 
got their first milligram of methadone or heroin, we said, well, when do we consider the treatment to be successful? When have the patients responded or improved sufficiently? And response was defined as an improvement in either physical health, mental health, or social health. And we assessed that by means of uh, self-report interviews. And part of the data was uh, validated against uh, police records and uh, urinalysis. So there should be an improvement in at least one of these three areas. And there should be no worsening of the situation in one of the three areas of at least 40%. And there should be no increase in illicit drug use, and most notably, not in illicit cocaine use. So it's what's quite a long-term hard drug using group with a lot of problems. Now this is the result of our trial. You remember what I said, the response. And what we could see is that in the trial with injectable heroin, the methadone group, the yellow bar, 32% of them had improved over the year according to our criteria. And this was 57% in the group that was receiving injectable heroin. And for the trial with inhalable heroin, we found similar results, although the response percentages were somewhat lower, 25% in the methadone control condition, and 48% in the uh, group that received inhalable heroin. And these differences, they are statistically significant. As you remember, we. I said, after 12 months, treatment with heroin was ended and patients, they were transferred to uh, adequate methadone maintenance treatment. And 70% of the patients, they had completed heroin-assisted treatment for a year. So 30% had discontinued treatment within those 12 months. Of those that had completed treatment, 53% had responded according to our criteria. And then, like I said, treatment with heroin was discontinued. And after two months, it turned out that 82% of them had deteriorated again. So as you can see on the left side, that is, for instance, the physical health situation. And the higher the score, the more problems. Patients entered with a score of 11.4, and they improved. Their problems dropped to a score of 4.9. And when heroin-assisted treatment was discontinued, their health situation deteriorated right away to about the same level as at the start of the trial. And yet you could see also for their mental uh, health, the involvement in illegal activities on the right side, their contact out of the drug scene with uh, non-drug users, and to a somewhat smaller extent also with respect to cocaine use. Now what is, I think, important is also to say something about the cost-effectiveness of heroin-assisted treatment. Heroin-assisted treatment is quite an expensive treatment, as you can see in the right-hand column, per year, Per person, the costs are almost 19,000 euros on average. It also depends on the, the size of the treatment center and the number of patients that were treated. But on average, almost 19,000 euros are the, only the medical cost of treatment. And that's only 2,500 euros for a methadone maintenance treatment on average per patient per year. However, as I showed, there was a large reduction in criminal activity, illegal activity, in patients with heroin-assisted treatment. Well, for most of the methadone patients, there was, uh, there was ongoing involvement in illegal activities, prostitution. And when you add up all the costs, not only the cost made for the treatment, but also the cost for society damaged due to uh, theft and crime, then you can see that the total cost of methadone maintenance treatments is around 50,000 euro per, per patient per year on average. And the cost of heroin-assisted treatments is about 37,000 euro per patient per year. So that means there is a net savings of around 13,000 euro per year per patient when treated with heroin-assisted treatment. Now, we also have some data on long-term treatment outcome. As I said, uh, since we had shown that discontinuation of heroin-assisted treatment resulted in a uh, a rapid deterioration of the situation of the patients, we no longer discontinue treatment now, so it's long-term heroin-assisted treatment that's offered to patients. And what we see is that treatment retention after four years is well over 50%. That also means that almost half of the patients, for some reason, have discontinued heroin-assisted treatment. They are mostly uh, meeting the criteria of treatment response, around 90%. 
And a lot of patients, they are free of problems, free of problems in the sense that they would no longer qualify to be eligible for heroin-assisted treatment at this moment, given they had no longer health problems, physical health problems, mental health problems, that they were no longer involved in illegal activities. And when we combine all these data, we see that about 25%, so one out of four patients in heroin-assisted treatment, is almost completely recovered, meaning he or she is still going to the heroin-assisted treatment program, mostly twice a day, seven days a week, but they no longer have mental health, physical health, or social problems. And the only thing that is still quite prevalent is cocaine use. It's only about half that have stopped cocaine use altogether, and it means also that the other half is still using illicit and mostly crack cocaine. At the moment, uh, heroin is no longer studied in a trial, but it's part of uh, routine clinical treatment. And what we see is that the results are more or less the same as we found in the trial. The number of patients that are injecting is much lower because most of the heroin users in the Netherlands, they are smoking heroin, they're chasing the dragon. So it's only one out of five that nowadays is still injecting heroin. They receive somewhat higher methadone doses at the moment. Treatment retention after a year is more or less comparable. It was 70%, it's now 79%. Treatment response is more or less comparable. Slightly over half of the patients, they respond to treatment. And what we saw is a somewhat an increase in fatalities, but they were not related to the medication that was prescribed. And it's most likely to be explained that some of the patients, they had a worst uh, health condition when they entered treatment and they died, for instance, of cancer or uh, cardiac uh, problems. And what we saw also is that there was a stronger reduction, somewhat stronger reduction in cocaine use. What is the current situation in the Netherlands? In 2006, heroin was registered as a medicinal product for the treatment of heroin addiction. At the moment, heroin-assisted treatment is provided in 15 uh, cities and in 17 treatment centers. The two bigger cities, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they have two treatment centers. And the number of patients in treatment is around 800. What is the international situation? Like I said, the Swiss, they were the first to start heroin-assisted treatment and to do research about it. Then in the Netherlands, we had a trial. There has been a small trial in Spain, a very large trial in Germany, in Canada, there has been a trial, and just recently, the United Kingdom re uh, presented their results of their trial. And all of the trials, and I won't explain this uh, slide, but what is important, everything that is to the right side of the red line is positive. And it, when the bars cross the right line, it might still be positive, but you're no longer certain whether it's statistical significantly positive. So only in the Spanish trial, the bars, they cross the red line, and that's because that was a very small study, and then they have, you have more uncertainty about the solidness of the data. So in all trials, they f we found positive results. And just recently, the Cochrane Review also mentioned that heroin-assisted treatment is a positive treatment for long-term heroin-addicted patients who do, not use, who do not respond favorably, who are treatment refractory to regular treatment. In terms of uh, treatment retention, illicit substance use, involvement in criminal activity and incarceration, and possibly a reduction in mortality. So still, there are some problems that remain. Like I said, uh, only 50%, somewhat over 50%, they respond favor favorably to heroin-assisted treatment. And one of the uh, remaining problems in the Netherlands was uh, co cocaine use among patients in heroin-assisted treatment. And we uh, set up a trial, and we are just waiting to have the data analyzed at the moment, in which patients in heroin-assisted treatment, they were uh, offered the option of contingency management. And contingency management is one of the most strongest psychosocial interventions that can reduce uh, cocaine use. And in contingency management, patients, they have to uh, uh, submit urine samples two or three times a week. And whenever the urine sample is uh, negative for cocaine, they get a reward, an incentive. And like I said, it's mo one of the most uh, effective interventions, psychosocial interventions for cocaine use. So at the moment we are 
waiting for the result of a trial in which half of the patients in heroin-assisted treatment received, as we called it, euphemistically in our research proposal, treatment as usual. So heroin-assisted treatment, we named it treatment as usual. And the other group received heroin-assisted treatment in combination with contingency management. And we are looking forward to the result. And there's one more thing I would like to tell you, although the sign says that I'm out of time. <laughs> but in our way to, uh, I, I was told when I came here that I had 45 minutes and it was reduced then to 30 and then to 25, so I'm still somewhere minute. Um, when we were on our uh, research uh, literature uh, looking for effective interventions for cocaine use, we came across contingency management, and another very important one is kind of substitution treatment for um, severe heavy cocaine users, more or less comparable to methadone maintenance or perhaps even heroin-assisted treatment. And what's the rationale of substitution treatment for cocaine users, for severe cocaine users, is by offering them a substitution medication, you can work on, you give them a means to control and to use cocaine in a safe or in a more safe way and not so much in the uncontrolled and harmful way that is accomplished by uh, illicit cocaine use. By providing them uh, substitution treatment, the cocaine users, you can also stabilize their biology, their addictive behavior and their day structure. And this might also give you a way, a platform to motivate them to accept supportive and additional interventions. And there's very interesting uh, literature about it by Shearer, Grabowski, and Herrin, which I can recommend to read. When you do uh, substitution treatment, it's always a, question, a matter of a balance, finding a balance between the effects, the positive effects of the intervention versus the potential harm, like we did with heroin-assisted treatment as well. And in the literature, you have many reviews about possibly uh, potentially effective substitution medications, and actually, there are two very promising ones. And the most promising ones, there are modafinil, which is a cognitive enhancer. It's been registered for the treatment of ADHD and narcolepsy. And dexamphetamine. And that's what we're trying to study now. But I won't go into detail. And there's one last slide. What we also found in the literature is that there have been a number of studies, and they are not very well controlled hard science studies, but they are quite informative. One was conducted in Bolivia and the other in Peru with cocaine-based dependent individuals. And in the Bolivian trial patients, they were offered uh, coca leaves. And the researcher reported improvement in mental health, in physical and in social functioning from pre-treatment to post-treatment of 48%. And like I said, it's no control trial, so it's no hard evidence, but it makes us at least curious to see whether that's an alternative substitution treatment. And the same was from uh, Peru, in which they used the coca tea. And there's also an American study in which they prescribed oral uh, cocaine tablets, which uh, reduced the effect of intravenous cocaine. So to conclude, and my conclusions are about heroin-assisted treatment. Now what is important, is that in a comprehensive treatment system, by which I mean a treatment system which has all different kinds of treatment modalities from abstinence-oriented treatment, maintenance treatment with either methadone or buprenorphine, but when you have a comprehensive treatment system, then for those heroin-dependent individuals that do not benefit from that first-choice treatments, heroin-assisted treatment is a safe and an effective treatment. What also is important, and we have shown that in our studies, is that the beneficial effects of heroin-assisted treatment, they are linked to treatment con continuation. After we stopped the treatment after 12 months, there was a rapid deterioration, deterioration. What we also found in studies and did not show is that there were actually no stable predictors for treatment retention or treatment response, except for one. And we found that in the Netherlands trial, but also in the uh, German trial, and something sim similar in the Canadian trial, is that patients who had a previous history of abstinence-oriented treatment, so who had been in, uh, for instance, clinical uh, residential treatment, but it might also be outpatient uh, uh, abstinence-oriented treatment, they were more likely to benefit from heroin-assisted treatment than patients who did not. 
And like I said, it's a costly but effective treatment. And finally, heroin-assisted uh, treatment as a routine treatment, as we have it now in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, it is equally effective and safe as a treatment conducted in a strictly controlled randomized trial. For Switzerland, but also for the Netherlands, I think, and in the other countries, heroin-assisted treatment is strictly uh, available for a well, small defined group of treatment resistant uh, methadone maintenance patients. It's important when heroin assisted treatment is provided that it's given along well described guidelines and that it's closely monitored. And if you want more information, we have a website, www.ccbh, or you can send me an email. Thank you very much. I have a ya les pasé las preguntas eh, para que las fueran ustedes analizando y nos eh, den sus comentarios. Una pregunta que creo que a lo mejor está en boca de varios y aquí me va a traicionar mi eh, vocación como abogado, es que a la hora de estudiar los casos, particularmente Portugal y Holanda, nos llama mucho la atención este problema de la puerta trasera. Hay una especie de dicotomía en la desregulación que se está haciendo o la regulación propiamente de la venta de drogas, en la cual en cierto lugar se pueden consumir y sin embargo la forma en que las drogas llegan a ese lugar es de índole ilegal. Entonces creo que para eh, los que hemos estudiado eso y particularmente para los que no lo han podido revisar sería interesante sus eh, palabras que expliquen cómo funciona algo que en un lugar es legal y sin embargo el suministro es ilegal. A lo mejor nos pueden explicar eso y pasar a eh, contestar las eh, preguntas que ustedes tienen. Tenemos más o menos 20 minutos, entonces pueden contestar eso y después quizá usar cinco minutos cada uno para contestar preguntas o dar sus uh, comentarios finales. Gracias. Ok, your question pertains to the cannabis coffee shops. And what is important, I think, is to realize that in the Netherlands, cannabis is still an illicit substance. And we have that strange kind of law which has made it possible to condone the sale of cannabis by coffee shops in small quantities under strict regulations to people who consume cannabis. So it's an illicit substance, but the coffee shop owner is allowed to have limited amounts of cannabis in his shop and to sell that to the customers, to the cannabis users, and it is condoned as long as he applies by a number of rules. For instance, he is not allowed to sell to youngsters, he is not to make advertisements, and there are some more. He's not allowed to sell hard drugs. And there is a, the problem on what they call the back door, because the coffee shop owner has to be supplied with cannabis. And the supply is not condoned. And that's the strange part of the law. And there's a lot of discussion going on. And there is, every once in a while, there are proposals to have cannabis decriminalized and legalized completely. Or there are discussions going on to set up a system of controlled supply on the back door. But that's more or less what I can say about the cannabis policy in the Netherlands. Okay, I have a first question, which is an easy one. Isn't heroin-assisted treatment available in Denmark as well? And the answer is yes. There's also a trial going on at the moment in Belgium. But what I should also mention is that heroin-assisted treatment is no longer available in Canada. It was only during the trial. It's hardly available at the moment in Spain. It's only for the patients that participated in the trial and that are still in treatment that it's ongoing. So at the moment, it's mostly available in Denmark, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Germany. And what maybe I should mention, that heroin-assisted treatment in the Netherlands is free for patients, so they don't have to pay for it. And it's quite an expensive treatment, not because of the cost of the medicine, of the heroin, that's only that's less than 10% of the total costs, but it's quite expensive because it's a medical treatment, and there's always uh, two nurses available and around who are dispensing uh, the heroin. There's a, a medical doctor around, there's psychiatric nurses around, social workers, and there also is some security around. So the expenses are mostly uh, related to the medical uh, personnel and, the, and the, the treatment center itself. Shouldn't we uh, provide heroin to all heroin addicted patients instead of methadone? Well, it's a discussion that has been going on in the Netherlands for a long time and it's still going on. 
but mostly our answer is no. It's a medical treatment, and for every medical uh, disorder, it's most common that you start with the most invasive treatment at the beginning, and methadone maintenance treatment is much less demanding for the patients than heroin-assisted treatment. Heroin-assisted treatment, you have to go there two or three times a day, seven days a week. You get, for a maximum per uh, dispensing moment, 400 milligrams, and when you smoke it, you have to smoke it in 45 minutes. And that's quite a ridiculous system. It's the same as when I would give you a bottle of nice wine or something else that you really like, and I said, but you have to eat it or you have to drink it within 45 minutes. So it's not a nice kind of treatment. You have to go to the treatment center, and you have to, uh, under supervision, consume the prescribed heroin. And when you're in methadone maintenance treatment, that can be effective for quite a lot of patients, and it's much more convenient. You have to take methadone only once a day, and most of the programs, they give take-home dosages. So it's still our opinion that first you should try methadone or buprenorphine treatment, and when that fa fails, uh, it's more likely to go over to heroin-assisted treatment. I have some more questions, but maybe we could answer them later on, and there's only one more that I would like to uh, respond to. Have you think of using ibogaine? And ibogaine is a, a substance that's in the shrub of an uh, African root. Uh, have you tried, have you think of using ibogaine for rehabilitation of addicts for, or opium? Well, we have thought of ibogaine many, many years ago. I think it was in the mid-1990s of the previous millennium. And we had written a proposal to study the effectiveness of ibogaine in the detoxification of heroin addicts, comparing it with regular detoxification. But that proposal was turned down by the Inspectorate of Health of the Netherlands. Uh, 